Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Monday Morning Mojo, your weekly dose of inspiration and thought-provoking conversations to help you see yourself in the world a little differently. And today I'm so excited because my coach is here uh, as a special guest. I want to welcome Terry Foster Nalin to the show. Terry has been a real estate professional and leader in the industry for 40 years. She has been a professional and certified coach for 15 years with numerous certifications that she's achieved over the years. She's also a serial entrepreneur and <laughs> someone who's just really passionate about helping people really see past their limitations. And she certainly continues to help me do the same. And I'm just so grateful that you made time to be on the show today, Terry. Welcome. Oh, you bet. Thank you for asking. I always love just feel like I sit or I'm sitting around a table having a cup of coffee talking about the world and that's what I feel like I get to do with you so thank you so much I appreciate it yeah and you know one of the things we could talk about a lot of things um but one of the things that I thought would be really important to talk about is something called EQ or emotional intelligence sometimes you see it referred to as EI and why it's important to have this conversation I spend a lot of time, as you do, in leadership and developing leaders and coaching leaders. And this is such an important part of leadership because it's an important part of self-awareness. And if we can't really understand ourselves and how to master ourselves, how do we hope to do that for other people? And I feel like you're one of a few people in my world who really has a lot of knowledge on this subject. And that's why I thought we could share this with our listeners, because I wonder how many people really understand what EQ is. So maybe we'll just jump into that, Terry. How would you define emotional intelligence for anyone listening? You know, it was funny because we just did this with your group and anybody yes. that's listening can ch jump on chat GPT, uh, then go, then Google. I guess that's the old fashioned way now they can Google or whatever, but they can look up what is emotional intelligence or what is EIQ, which is emotional intelligence quotient. And it's different than just intelligence like IQ, right? Most assessments that we take, let us know kind of who we are, possibly how smart we are. And it leaves out this part, the emotional side of who we are. And emotional intelligence is actually defined as the capability for us to be able to recognize our own emotions first, then that of others, right? Change yourself first, then look at others, and then understand the complex feelings that might go along with that, get where we're not labeling them inappropriately when we talk to people, and honestly, it helps us guide our unbiased thinking and becomes unconscious, uh, meaning it just becomes a part of what we do once we learn more about it. So learning about emotional intelligence means helping us look inwardly at how the world sees us from an emotional perspective. If, is that a good enough definition, you think? Yeah, I, I, I think so. And why is it so important? Because, you know, I sometimes, I don't know if you would relate to, sometimes I feel like we talk about things, it's part of our everyday life, it's part of our vernacular, but to many people listening, this could be very new and a very different concept for them. So why is it important for us to talk about and understand EQ and, and really ultimately look for ways to raise our, our EQ? Well, when you have high emotional intelligence, you are more apt to adapt to audiences. Even if you're one-on-one, -on -one, that's an audience, right? You're more able to adapt to the audiences or situations that you're in, right? Even if it's family, right? Because you're aware of possibly what's going on internally. When you have high emotional intelligence, you learn to be more self-disciplined and possibly even take control of performance and your productivity because you're aware of what you need to do first. You know, a lot of times we get really excited about doing everything. And mm -hmm. sometimes we just need to focus in on what we need to do first. High emotional intelligence, human beings have abundant thinking. They're abundant in teamwork and collaboration as well, because they're aware of themselves first and they're aware of possibly where they have opportunity to develop and they work on that and they stay focused. So 
They leverage relationships better when you have higher emotional intelligence. When you aren't aware of your EQ, you're subject to emotional outbursts. So, so I'm sorry to interrupt you, but emotional outbursts, meaning they can't control their response or they might respond inappropriately too to a situation. Exactly. It might show up like weird energy, moodiness. Uh, they're not listening to me. You know, those kinds of things. They Sometimes when you have low emotional intelligence, another one is you feel misunderstood at times and unappreciative. And that might show up in a victim behavior Mm -hmm. Like in victim behavior, low, this is interesting. You have to think about this for a minute. I hope I say it right. Low emotional intelligence demonstrates itself sometimes on winning and competition only. Tell, tell us more about that because, you know, I think a lot of people who are listening to the show, I attract a lot of entrepreneurs, realtors, salespeople, right? People who just want to live a bigger life in some way. So I think a lot of us listening are like, oh, we... I want to be a driver. I want to be competitive. I want to win. But yeah. you said something that was important. It's that it's the only thing. Yeah. So tell us more about what that what that means. When when you when and remember these aren't good or bad. These are just signs, right? When you find yourself only wanting to win and only wanting to compete, mm. then it breaks the definition of collaboration and teamwork. Meaning you might be winning at something that other people don't see as a win. So you're breaking teamwork or you're breaking rapport with people. Many people listening have heard coaches, speakers talk about lead and lag measures, right? Sometimes we pay attention to the lag measure, which is the winning in the competition. And we don't know possibly why we're winning and competing. We're just out winning and competing. And that can't last. That's something that you, you, I mean, it just can't go on and on forever unless you absolutely know what the outcome of winning is, what the outcome of the competition is, and then possibly what the lead measures are that get you there, if that makes sense. It, does, so it makes a lot of sense. You, you can win for winning's sake. Mm. Right? You can compete for competing's sake. And at times, and I know, Anna, you see this, at times you want to win and compete so much, you actually lose sight of what the overall vision is yes. that, winning, that winning gets you. And that can lead to burnout. That can lead to a lot of health issues. That can lead to dysfunction on teams. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's another thing um, that I feel is important to convey today about you know the subject on emotional intelligence is that it's also about how the world connects and relates to you and what you leave in the wake, right? Like we all have to, we create a ripple effect. And the key is, you know, if you think about a boat in the lake, right? There are times yeah. when it's leaving those little ripples around and you know it's been there. And then there are times when it's going so fast and furious with a lot of disregard that it leaves like this wild wake. And, and so we have to think about what is it that we're doing and how we're responding and how we're connecting and how we're showing up around people because it's about the response that we elicit through our behavior too and what our behavior does to other people. So that is perfect. You you just nailed it because if we're focused on- happens when two coaches get together, people. <laughs> getting, you get excited. So <laughs> when you focus on winning and competition, you tend to forget or understand what others are thinking and feeling. It's almost like you get so in the groove that you forget about the people around. Like it doesn't matter what they're thinking or feeling. I'm going to. And you forget you're pointing there and the team's supposed to go with you. I do this sometimes with discipline. I can get in this lane of discipline because discipline serves me to get things done that I need to get done and getting in that lane of discipline sometimes, self-discipline, gets so crazy disciplined that it's not good because I might be leaving other people behind or causing other people to work outside their natural zone. So it's the same thing, like high emotional intelligent people that tend to have higher discipline, higher self-discipline, but then they can fall back into low emotional intelligence by getting way too disciplined and leaving the team behind, if that makes sense, right? Because sure. you kind of start winning and competing in your own discipline. Like you kind of feel good about it. And then you go, oh, wait a minute. People aren't following me anymore. So 
Low emotional intelligence can also lead to fewer long-term quality relationships. So we all want long-term quality people around us. If we're leaders, that's what causes us to, to be successful. It isn't about what we do. It's about the people that we bring around us and how we help them so that we can have quality long-term relationships with people. And what does that look like? Yeah. And, you know, I think to tie into what we're saying is really helping everyone understand that developing your leadership, right, that overarching thought is so important, regardless of who you think you might be in an organization or out in the world, we all have leadership potential. And we all have to understand that if we're dealing with people on any level, we are a leader. And so this That's is right. important for us to understand that in order to really connect with people, in order to really lead people, in order to hire people, attract people. I mean, even if you just want more followers on your social media, That's right? right? You have to understand all of these elements of leadership. And as I said at the top of the show, at the core is self-awareness and emotional intelligence. <laughs> you just made me think of something. How often can you get on social media and look at a post and go, high intelligence, low, high, um, low, right? It's funny. You get to that point where once you even understand your own personality, your natural adapted styles, you become aware of like, you know, what you're doing and what others are doing. And it just becomes a whole thing. But this is why to kind of go along with the question that you asked about and before we went into high and low emotional intelligence is corporations are recognizing this. Mm -hmm. And they're tight, large corporation. There's a Harvard business study that gives you some really great data around why lar large corporations and organizations strongly value these traits, these hard traits for, and on emotional intelligence, because they want people to match up with what their organization stands for. So emotional intelligence helps organizations understand the capacity of people having empathy. Mm -hmm. uh, integrity, analytical skills, passion, creative thinking, verbal communication, all of these fall under self-control, like they, they all yeah. fall under emotional intelligence. So organizations are starting to go, there is something about this, especially with the five generations in the workplace. We yeah. all have different layers of emotional intelligence because of our past and how we were raised. And we're seeing young, young people get into wor the workforce now. And this is a key, key assessment that would help leaders understand their people better. So. Yes. So number one, we, we'll put the link to that Harvard business study in the show notes. So okay. if, I'll send like, that to you. Yeah, okay. that'd be great. So we can do that. And I'll just say in my experience as a business leader, I have seen this so many times, and I think that you're right. In the last decade, we've become more aware, I certainly have, about this other side, right? Because there are two components to, I think, anyone's success. It's what you bring in in terms of skills and track record, right? But there, there's also the behavioral profile and the emotional intelligence. Yeah. And you could have someone, and I've seen it time and time again, I've had, had to counsel or consult people who are feeling like they're hitting a brick wall. I, I have a client right now, actually, that I'm coaching from a different industry, and she's the VP of her company. And the board of directors said, you know, you need to talk to someone about helping you become aware of how you're showing up She's got the credentials, she's got the experience, she's got the skill set, but it's it's the other tools that she's lacking and understanding what her behavior profile is really saying about her, which like you said before, it's not good or bad, it's just what it is. And understanding though what EQ means and and really I think embracing that you can understand it but also evolve and and improve it. So if you're working with someone as a coach, Terry, yeah, and you're helping them become more aware of their emotional uh, intelligence or that, e, you know, emotional intelligent quotient, and the goal is to help them improve and grow, what are some ways that people can improve their, their EI? Okay. So the first step of anything is awareness, right? It's like what you and I are talking about today. So there will be people that listen to us talk about this and they're going to go, okay, now I'm aware that I may have an opportunity 
to learn a little bit more about how the world sees me. So if that's the case, then they may need to take an assessment to start. They may want to put themselves in a class where it's being taught. They may want to look that up on YouTube and find a video to watch, right? You are aware of it now. Now, what are you going to do about it? Because the next piece that you have to understand for yourself is, am I bought in to what this really could do for me, could do to my organization, could do to my leadership? If you want to get more studies on it, the Harvard Business Review will be a great link that you can go through and read about the, the information that they've gathered to support these facts, right? So you've got to buy in. Once you're aware of you something- You have to be committed. You have to be committed right. to wanting to change or grow. You, you either buy into it, the idea of it, or you don't, right. neither good or bad. If you buy in, then you're committed. Then you've got to figure out, now how can I be committed to change? So let's say you take an assessment, you're bought into it. You're aware of it. You're bought into this can help you grow. You take an assessment, you work with your coach on it, whatever that might be the next step. Then you become committed about making changes once you know what the changes are that you need to slowly make. And these are not changes that you make immediately. They're little changes. In fact, in the assessment that Debbie Frapp and I use, there is there are some work questions that you can actually ask yourself and work on that and go, this is the next step I could take. And it gives you suggestions for that. And then that becomes a tool you take to your coach like Anna, with your clients, they could bring you the, your, the assessment and then it's something you start working on with them. Like what could be the next step that I could take to improve this in myself? And it might be as simple as noticing this week how empathetic you're feeling for situations that you, you come in contact with, right? So mm -hmm. it's, that's it's awareness, buy-in or not buy-in and yeah. commitment and then create strategies after you're committed. Right. What, and would be, what would be a strategy? Like one thing that comes to mind that I've offered up to some people as a suggestion, and I know some people take it or leave it, is journaling. Because if you can slow down long enough, after you become aware of something, right? Like you said, that's the first step. It's sort of your opportunity. Yeah. Now you got to figure out what to do with it. So just being able to sit down with a couple of good questions and really give yourself an opportunity to stop and think and write it out could be really, really a catalyst for, for some actions, right? What, what else would you suggest besides that? You know, journal journaling. Absolutely. I think I told you that you heard me say earlier this year, I'm putting myself in timeout uh, every yes. birthday. <laughs> I thought uh, but, great. we all need to do that more, put ourselves in timeout. Literally. I don't know any other way, other do you thing. Schedule a timeout? Not to get off topic, but do you actually like schedule it? Yeah, I do. And then there's times I get weird breaks that I wasn't expecting during my coaching day. And instead of like diving into catching up, because I'm somebody that loves to catch up, like catch up, catch up, catch up so that mm -hmm. I'm not behind you. Know, my biggest fear is being behind in something or fear of missing out of something. So I want to be caught up. So instead of getting in that, oh, that groove of catching up, I, that might be the time I need to go put myself in my time out and I go mm -hmm. sit in my sitting room or like yesterday I had a break and it was actually sunny here and I went out and sat outside in the sun for 15 minutes and it was amazing. And that's a self-discipline that helps me get back together. Sometimes I just sit there and think about who do I need to be reaching out to today? You know, who's on my mind? And in my world, it's kind of like God speaks to me about people that are in my life that I may need to touch. Yeah. And like, tell me, you know, make it aware. Like I just kind of talk to myself and. But you know, what you just described, Terry, is a sign of high EQ. Yes. Right. What you literally just described, you know, and it may look different for all of us, but it's, it's being in touch with your thoughts in touch with what's happening around you, with the people around you and, and making an effort to connect mm -hmm. because that is another thing I think the world is craving is connection. Yeah. And, uh, you know. I had Diana Kokoska on this show a few months ago after oh. she launched her book. I know she was on your podcast too. And she talked about this learned helplessness that we've all, you know, many people are, are really struggling with and maybe not aware since COVID especially. And I think that ties into EQ as well. This, this learned helplessness, feeling like we're a little stuck because we can all feel stuck at times. 
But the key is knowing that you have the ability to move forward. Even if you have to ask for help, you have the ability to get unstuck. And yeah. I think that all relates back to EQ as well. Don't you agree? Oh, totally. Tell anytime you're doing anything to improve yourself, as long as you're moving in the right direction, then you're taking a step. And I, I totally believe that you can always have community and peer partners that help you with that. And absolutely coaches and mentors in your life. We all need that. But they're making yourself feel like you've accomplished something. Helping yourself in that direction also helps with depression. It, mm -hmm. it helps with emotional anxiety. It helps with a lot of things because anytime we feel better about doing something for ourselves and we can celebrate something that we've done, you saw me light up when I talked about putting myself in timeout because that's a win for me to do that. And it's kind of funny, but at the end of the day, I feel better about myself for knowing I can go sit for 15 minutes. That's a big mm -hmm. deal for me. So it helps us in all that we do, which absolutely helps us in all of our leadership areas with people around me because they can see us, they can feel us. Yeah. So in your opinion, when you see someone who is really struggling with a lot of what we've talked about. Mm -hmm. And and this might be more a, coach, a question about coaching in, in itself. How do you help them to connect to that awareness? Or is there a question you like to ask or is there a certain exercise that you like to use? You know, how do you help someone get out of the pattern they've been in and, and move more into awareness? You know, the biggest question we can ask ourselves when we notice something we're not happy with about ourselves or Maybe it's just we feel like we can't get over the hump in a particular area in our life or there's a relationship gone bad. You know, the first thing that a great coach can help you do is help you understand what that is, like narrow it down to something, narrow it down to one thing. And then once you've narrowed it down, the next thing you we all need to do is go back in the timeline of our life and find out. Where else is that same thing showing up? Mm -hmm. And it could be in a different relationship. It could be at a workplace. It could be with friendships. It could be, you know, interpersonal. It could be with yourself, right? Where is it showing up? And then what was happening to cause it, right? Because those of us that have a timeline, some of us have bigger timelines than others because we're mm -hmm. older, we can go back and pinpoint when we remember it happening. So we're going back in time and looking for an incident, a feeling, and it, it could be good or bad. It doesn't have to always be bad, right. right? A behavior that started showing up as a reaction to something. Mm -hmm. Debbie Frapp, who's, you know, my partner in Matters of Influence, and we're both, you know, MAPS coaches. You know, I don't know what I do without her in this arena when we talk about this, because, you know, this is such a big part of her history and her life and her work you know, what she did in her work before she came into actual coaching is being able to help people go back and self-discover where did that start? Yes. And that's just part of awareness. But until somebody asks you that question, what is it specifically you've got going on? What are you feeling? What do you want to feel? And then taking you back to when was the first time you remember feeling like that? Then what was happening around that? Yes. That is one of the best values of coaching that a coach can provide. Yes. People discover that. I, and as a coach, you know, who has those tools too in her toolbox, I think it's also about helping people take away a new meaning, right? Because we attach meaning to things. And again, does it make it right or wrong, good or bad? It's just the meaning. And, and what if we could see it differently? Yeah. And what if we could attach a different meaning to it? Would that change the way we feel today? Because that pattern that continued... I think if, if you take anything from today's episode is that you have more power than you might realize that, you know, you just have to step into the driver's seat of your own life. And maybe you need a coach, maybe you need some support, but you have the ability to change things. You have the ability to learn new things, to unlearn things, to create new path, you know, in your thinking, the brain is amazing. And that's really what we have, I think, as a huge opportunity as human beings, right? Because that's the gift we have as, as humans, because most species don't have that ability. Most people don't realize it's a cycle. 
And anybody listening can do this with themselves. They don't have to have a coach to do it. They don't have to have a mentor or friend. But once you ask yourself these questions, then it would be good to go back to somebody that you trust in your life and review this with them, right? So the typical pattern in human beings is something happens, right? An event happens. And then we analyze it. And then we create a story around it. And then we tend to get support for our own story. Whatever that story is we created, we go get support. We gather even more evidence to make it be right. And we've embedded that that story is so right in our head. We carry that story through everything else that happens in our life. And it could be view of people. It could be view of relationships. Like every relationship is like the other. Every human is like the other. But that story is going to stick until you uncover why that story was created. And then what are the opportunities on the other side of that cycle to come out and break that story, right? So uh, that's what we carry through our life and our brain takes that in. And once you create a really strong story about something, it's hard to break that story unless you understand it and somebody can help you even talk it out or walk you through it and how it could be different. And we could, we could do that every day of our life, probably. Yeah. You know, just to shift this conversation slightly, you know, we've talked a lot about coaching throughout this conversation. Uh -huh. What fuels you as a coach? You've been working in this field for 15 years. What is your passion for it or your purpose around being a coach? You know what? It's so funny you say that because, you know, before the year started and we were, you know, reviewing our value words, my husband and I, and making sure everything, the top three words were still the same. You know, I had to ask myself, we, we talk about retirement, like you throw the word around. But I watched a mother who never really completely retired because if you retire, you're retiring mentally. And mm -hmm. the thing that I love about coaching is that coaching is with you always. Like the skill of asking questions, the skill of being present, the skill at be a level three listener. You take that into your churches, you take it into your family. So honestly, you're into your business. You're a coach all the time. Just like when John Maxwell, one of our mentors, right? We share, mm -hmm. you know, when he says, everybody's a leader, whether you think you are or aren't, you are. Because someone's watching you. Right. And leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. So if you're influencing someone to even make a decision or your behavior is influencing. If you're a parent, you're a leader. Oh, yeah. Right? And honestly, I see leadership as being a really great coach. Most great leaders in your life, if you look at them, they know how to ask great questions. They know how to call you out when they can call you out. And typically, they call you out through questioning and you just feel it in them, right? They don't have to be aggressive. You just feel it. And I've, I've realized that that's what I'm, co I'm passionate about. Even when I was a team leader in a Keller Williams market center, I never liked the thought of selling a, somebody to join our company. I never, even when I sold real estate for years, and that's what I did. I didn't love to be thought of as a salesperson. And now that I can go back in my timeline and look at it, I was nothing more than a coach. Yeah. It was just, it hadn't come out yet, right? And consulting, coaching is different, but at the same rate, I can be a coach the rest of my life. So that's what makes me passionate about it. And coaching helps me carry out my number one value, which is creating legacy. And legacy is not about money that I'm leaving behind, although that's a great thing. But it's not about money that I'm leaving behind. It's about what I'm leaving in people. So the value of legacy ties directly into coaching because coaching is a vehicle that I can help leave legacy in people. So that's why I'm passionate about it. And, and there's, you can grow every day as a coach. Right? Oh, yes. I've said that, right? We grow exponentially because we are committed to other people's growth, right? Yeah, it's they teach us. Yes. Yes. And I think that being a leader is just a journey of personal development. Being a coach is the same. An entrepreneur is the same. You know, if anyone works with you or knows you, we know that legacy is important to you. Yeah. Why is that so significant? You know, you touched on it just a, a briefly here, but why, why is that so significant to you? Why is legacy significant? Yes. Mm -hmm. I want not just my kids, which, you know, there's 
two kids and five grandchildren, right? I want them to know no matter what age they are, no matter what generation they, you know, fit into. And Anna, you know, I'm a geek on generational diversity. Yes. Mm -hmm. That should be another conversation. That should be a whole nother conversation. There's more coming on that, right? Because I want them to not only legacy to me is helping people do more than what you did and then also do what you did and take it into generations way to come, whether it's what I believe spiritually, what I believe about work, whatever, whatever it is, I want that to be carried on. It may not be carried on through my children. It may be carried on through other relationships in my life, the people that I've worked with, people that I've touched, they may carry out something that I start. And that all starts with people understanding your story. So whatever it is that you want, that you're passionate about, that you want to have carried out in your life, whether it's a nonprofit or whatever that is, you want that to extend itself into future generations so that it can continue on, right? That it just Mm -hmm. never stops. And I I don't know if that answered your question or not. It did. I I think it's because, you know, legacy is important to you because you're not well, I think you are someone who is very present. One of the things that you helped me to learn when I still try to emulate from you is that ability to take the time out, to to sit and plan, to think. John Maxwell teaches us that, and, and you, I know you live that out. And I think that even though you're very present, you also are very mindful about the fact that we're moving through this life. It's a journey. And, and there are people that are coming through life with us yeah. and you want to leave something significant for them, something yeah. that you want them to see and learn and, and also then go on and teach. And that's legacy, right? It's creating cycles of positive change for people. Yeah. And hopefully some of those cycles will break too. I bet part mm-hmm. of legacy is teaching people mm-hmm. do things differently than you did. Yes. So like if you ask my kids, what is a conversation they hear me, hear from me a lot, right? Taylor and Tara, they would say, you say, take risk early. And what I mean by that is take financial risk at the age that you can take them at. Don't wait till you get older. Don't live such a life that you're, you're so conservative that you're not looking for opportunity all the time that's around you and taking risk so that your future is built faster. Mm-hmm than what I built mine, right? So sometimes they learn through things that they could, you could have done differently. So mm-hmm. it's, that's part of it too. So I said, you know, when I introduced you, Terry, you're, you just celebrated 40 years in the industry. Uh-huh. So when you think back to Terry 40 years ago, yeah, and if you could be able to go back and tell her something, give her some guidance or advice, what would you have said? Oh my gosh. It literally goes back to think I would have told myself to think more outside the box Mm. and literally take a little more risk and dream bigger, you know, in the real estate industry and living in this same place where I started my career, it breaks my heart. Like it makes me honestly sick to my stomach that I think about all of the limited thinking that I had back then about buying a property. I mean, I was in the real estate industry for God's sake. And yes, interest rates were like 16 and a half percent when I got in, but it created a lot of grit. But within that first five years and watching the real estate cycle change, the properties I could have snatched up or created partnerships with people and done things differently. I just wasn't thinking about it. Then I was thinking more about surviving and paying bills Uh, And all of that versus growing my future. So at 20, I wish I would have grown my future and been a little bit more outside the box. I broke the box by not finishing college, number one, because, you know, my era, you go to college and you get a degree. And I stepped away from college to be an elementary education teacher. Mm. I didn't know that. Oh, mm. that's something else we have in common. I thought I was going to be a teacher, but we are yeah. teachers, right? We are. I, that's the whole point. I ended up I ended up doing it, just not with children. And it wouldn't have been pretty if I would have been in a classroom. I'd have burned out in the first year, I'm sure. God but, bless the um, teachers out there listening. God bless you. Yeah. And oh, they're like that you can't pay teachers enough. And 
my, I mean, my mom was in real estate. My father-in-law was a builder. It was, I was, we're carrying on our legacy. My kids are in, you know, my daughter and son-in-law are in the business. My niece, my sisters, my mom left a legacy behind now that we've all been able to take advantage of and mm-hmm. grow the way we want to grow. So hopefully there will be a legacy of entrepreneurs, whether it's real estate or not, left in my path that are oh, taking I'm sure. a little more I have, risk. Yeah. I have no I doubt. Am. So as we wrap up today, Terry, is there something that we didn't talk about or a question I didn't ask you, whether it was about EQ, personal development, coaching yourself that you would like to add so we can leave a little bow on the gift we've given to our listeners today? If, if, if somebody asked me this this past week, like if there, if there was one thing that I could help people improve that would create higher connection with other people, what would it be? And I said, well, it's real funny because um, a couple of weeks ago, I did a a leadership retreat. I'll just call it that. And one of the activities that we did was a tell your story activity. And I got this from, you know, my mentor, Mo Anderson, you know this, Anna. And this was back in 1996. And one of the most impactful things she had us do was sit down and write out our story. And back then, my story was a little less than it is now. And it fit on one page. And it was about how did you get here today? And we don't know how impactful our stories are until we reread our stories that we write. And we keep adding to our story. And we share those stories with people. There always is an opportunity to share something that happened in your life. In fact, this happened last night right here in our home in life group. David and I were able to tell our story of how we found each other and and how we, you know, why we got married and had a lot of failures in it and had a lot of wow moments in it of people around us that we didn't think we'd be sharing. And that story was impactful. And uh, we will be forever connected to those people in some form or fashion because we share our story. So I would encourage everybody to not take for granted the story that you have and how impactful it can be with people. And if there's a reason that you don't want to share parts of your story, like I've got divorce in my story, I've got cancer in my story, and those aren't easy things to share, but I bet there somebody listening might have the same feelings about those two topics that I do. And you're going to learn to help people through some of those things as you build and grow in relationships with people. So take your story seriously and how it can help you connect to people. Yeah, because we all have the power to impact a life and inspire yeah. people through that story. And yeah, that, you're, mi- you're missing an opportunity. about here on this podcast a lot. Yeah, you're missing an opportunity if you don't. Yeah. So Terry, how can anyone connect with you or find you? You know, because I'm sure that someone fell in love with you today listening to this. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure. You mentioned uh, that you have a podcast, Matters of Influence, right? With yeah. Debbie Frapp, a fellow friend and coach. Oh, and, my, uh, best, my best friend, my sister from another mother. We're so opposite, yet we're so alike. Yes, Debbie Frapp and I are co-owners of a company called Matters of Influence. And you can go to that website, look us up. It's becoming more and more interactive. Debbie is so highly certified in so many things. It's unbelievable. But we are also Keller Williams Maps coaches. So inside the industry, that's what we do. We coach inside the industry. We coach companies outside the industry that are not associated with real estate. There is a lot of, like I said, go to the website and look up credentials. But that's where we are. The podcast, you've already mentioned that. And that's where you can reach us. It's pretty easy. And I, of course, oh, and on Facebook, all social media, you can get to us on social media matters of influence. And I am so fortunate to have you in my world as my coach, but an advisor, a mentor, a friend. And I really appreciate you being here today. This was a great conversation. And I know that um, we've given some people a lot to think about. And that's my intention for this podcast. You know, it's doing great work. You're doing mm-hmm. great work. I remember when I said, why don't you do that for everybody yeah. here? I know you remember I said, hey, you know, it was back in May of 2020. Uh, mm-hmm. Terry and I have been working together for years. And I and I just fell was during that time when you were feeling like people were learning helplessness. And I thought, you know what? 
I'm going to go out there. I'll start something on a Zoom call. Then I decided to start a Facebook group and, and stream it live through the group. And I did that for three years. And then finally, we were like, why are we doing this as a podcast? <laughs> exactly. And it's fun. It's so much fun. It's really gratifying, too, because I, you never really, and this is the truth about life, and we'll end on this. You really never know whatever you say or how you show up. You don't really truly understand the impact it's making. So, yes, we have all kinds of analytics that I can look at as far as the show's performance, but I don't really know what it's doing in someone's life, but I trust that it's doing amazing things. And whether it's impacting one life or thousands, that one life matters. And that's why, you know, you, you wanted to do it and continue to do it. And, and it, it's changing my life too, in the process. Exactly. So absolutely. It's great. It continually changes our lives. So, yeah. All right. Well, thanks again for being here, Terry. You and bet. thank all of you for being here every week. It's just great to hang out with you. It's my pleasure. Thanks. All right.